I want to invite Barb to come forward. I forgot her. There she is. I didn't. I couldn't find her. But Barb's gonna come give an announcement with a decoration. <laughs> Good morning. I have a mystery that I need you all to help me solve. Does this coat look like anything that you might have worn on January the 21st? It was a really cold Sunday. If this is your coat, claim it. It will be in the coat closet. And if you happen to have a dark blue jacket, it's a puffy one that has ugly jack has ugly gloves in it they're fleece they look like men's gloves so if you have that to bring the coat back you don't have to tell me that it, you brought it or anything just put it in the closet please and i'll pick it up thank you <laughs> There's something happening next Sunday. Eric wants to tell you about it. My favorite holiday of all year is coming up <laughs> next Sunday. Does anyone have any guesses on what that might be? <laughs> Exa yeah, exactly. It's not Valentine's Day. <clears throat> so. <laughs> so you all are invited to join us in the Fellowship Hall next Sunday, February 11th at 5 p.m. Or, or a little before. Uh, for a fun evening watching the, big, the game on the big TV, please sign up on the clipboards being passed around to bring soup, uh, crackers, or other, other game day snacks. And then plan to wear team attire to support your favorite team, even if they aren't playing. I am a Saints fan, so they haven't been in the playoffs for a while. Um, and then also, please bring a food pantry donation to place in one of the specially decorated boxes uh, where you can vote on which team you think will win. Thank you very much, thank you. Any other announcements you wanna share this morning? All right, I need you to welcome your neighbor. So look to your left, look to your right. Say good morning, say spring is on its way. Spring is on its way. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Let's prepare our hearts and our minds to worship our loving and living God. Please stand as you are able and join me in this morning's invocation. We greet you, welcoming God, 
with our many morning moods. Some of us could not wait to get here. Some of us just made it. Some of us know exactly why we've come. Others are not yet sure. Still, someone calls us to gather and to worship you. Amen. Please join me in this morning's opening prayer. Good people of the church, lift up your eyes and see. Have you not seen or heard? Our God greets us here. Good servants of the Most High, open your ears to hear. Have you not seen or heard? Our God greets us here. Good children of the light, Open your hearts and know our Lord is here. For we have seen, heard, and now we know God's life guides us here. Amen. Please be seated. This morning's first scripture reading is from Isaiah 40, verses 21 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the earth, circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretch out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in. Who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see, who created these? He who brings out the host and the numbers them, calling them all by name, because he is great in strength, mighty in power, and not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and assert, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is discarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? 
The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint.
This morning's Gospel reading comes from Mark 1, verses 29 through 39. As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. He came, took her by the hand, and lifted her up. Then the fever left her, and she began to serve them. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed by demons, and the whole city was gathered around the door. And he cured many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons, and he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to the deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions hunted for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is searching for you. He answered, Let us go to the neighboring towns, so that I might proclaim the messages here, also, there also. For that is what I came out to do. And he went throughout all of Galilee, proclaiming the message in their synagogues and casting out demons. The word of God for the people of God. God. Will you join me in a moment of prayer? Gracious God, you have not forsaken us or forgotten us. You are here with us in the blooming of this new day. So help us to wake up to this day. Wake up our senses to feel your presence and the taste of communion bread and the smell of fresh flowers and the touch of a friend's hand in the sight of a crowded pew and in the sounds of our glorious choir. We praise you, Lord, and we thank you. Amen. About eight years ago in March, Eric and I hopped on a mega bus to Chicago. Anybody remember the mega bus? With excitement? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so. We hopped on the mega bus to Chicago eight years ago next month with a few of our friends as we decided to spend a week serving on a small farm located inside the city of Chicago. And it's this farm is used primarily to serve the nearby community in the farmer's markets that they have each summer. I was so ex excited that week to spend a week w doing what I imagined would be some light work. It would include pink gardening gloves and cute work boots. I imagined we would be planting flowers, or at least we'd get to look at some flowers. And I'm so sorry to all the farmers in here who are hearing this and are so embarrassed for me because clearly I know nothing about farming, gardening, or planting. And they probably didn't want my help, but they got it. <laughs> because in early March in Illinois, snow and frost are still on the ground. And I quickly learned that farming is a lot of heavy lifting and not a lot of smelling the roses. Can anybody say amen to that? <laughs> I'm a city girl, can you tell? We spent most of the week picking up trash, moving mulch around, and smelling like, well, you can imagine. The thing is that on this short trip, we were reminded, mostly it was just me that needed reminded, that every time we go somewhere to serve, we go to serve the needs of the community and never to serve the needs of what we assume the community has. And the way we respond to the needs of the community can say a lot about our privilege. It can also say a lot about our partnership. Today's gospel text, it has a few things to teach us about service and a few reminders also on how important it is to respond to the needs of others and to respond with, with gentleness. Jesus is covering a lot of ground in just these 10 short verses in that gospel reading from Mark that we just heard. He, Jesus, he is on a mission as he's just begun his healing ministries with the earliest of his disciples joining him on the journey. Remember, we're only in the first chapter of Mark's gospel. 
In Mark's gospel, there's no birth story. There's no extra storytelling. We're only 28 verses in, and Jesus, he's already on the move. While we don't know yet, from, this, from just the verses read aloud this morning, we're told nine verses prior that Jesus begins his healing ministries on the Sabbath day. So when he enters the house of Simon and Andrew to heal Simon's mother-in-law, his next healing is also taking place on the Sabbath. He's spending time healing on the Sabbath, and that is a statement. He's making a statement because Jesus' followers and his adversaries, they're all aware of the fact that healings don't take place on the Sabbath because healings are considered work. And yet... I think many of us know or we're reminded often from dozens of other stories in the Gospels that Jesus, he never lets the rigid rules of religion get in the way of his good news of love and grace. And so sometimes he breaks those rigid rules to teach us a few things. I think today's text, those 10, 10 verses from Mark, They can be broken up into four different stories, or four different sections. First, there's the healing of Simon's mother-in-law. Then there are the healings that take place after the Sabbath begins. Those are uh, the healings of, of demons that are possessing people. The third section begins in verse 35 when Jesus leaves for a deserted place to pray and he's found by his anxious disciples. And then lastly, there's the story that ends with the reminder of the thesis, the crux of Jesus' ministry, that as he journeys from town to town, from house to house, from synagogue to synagogue, his words and his actions will proclaim and they're going to lead all toward the good news of God's love. So those are kind of the four sections I think we can break this text up into. Let's go back to dissect that first section of the story. After Jesus heals Simon's mother-in-law, who was in bed with a fever, we're told that Jesus takes her by the hand and he raises or lifts her up. I imagine it's like what Eric has to do right now when I'm trying to get out of the bed or off the couch or literally do anything. Jesus just lifts her up. What we miss here in the English translation when Jesus is lifting her up, what we miss is the word that is used to describe her raising. In Greek, it's the same word used later in chapter 16 to describe the raising of Christ in his very own resurrection. In other words, this healing of Simon's mother-in-law, I think it's a type of revealing, it's a a foretelling for Jesus' disciples of what is to come later in the story. Christ's resurrection, it's being revealed already in the first chapter to his disciples and to us. And what happens next, I think, is also worthwhile to consider. The moment that the fever leaves Simon's mother-in-law, I like to think that she had a couple options of what to do next. Maybe she could have stayed in bed and relaxed, recovered a little bit more. Maybe she could sit around and gab for a little while like good Midwesterners do anytime guests are over. Maybe she could spend some time complaining about how bad her fever was, because that's what I do when I, after I start feeling better after a terrible cold. But she doesn't do any of that. Instead, the text tells us that she gets up, she rises up, she doesn't waste any time, and she begins to do what? She serves all the guests who are already in their home. When you don't feel good, you don't want guests there, right? But she just gets up and she starts serving anyway. Simon's nameless mother-in-law, I think, has now given us two examples of what it looks like to live Christ-like. Not only is her raising up a sign of the resurrection, but now she wastes no time to bring hospitality to her home and to selflessly serve all who are gathered already there in her house. She's the truest, most authentic disciple that shows up in this story. In fact, she's like the first disciple found in Mark's gospel. 
Her response, it points us closer to Christ, who is the most gracious host, the most selfless servant of us all. And you know, I saw evidence of this, of this kind of service here at the church on Friday this week. I arrived at 8 a.m. to begin preparing for Nancy's funeral. I thought I was gonna be the first one in this building. Ha. And I thought that because that's the earliest I've ever walked into this building. <laughs> little did I know, little did I know that when I arrived, there were already more than eight people here setting up extra chairs and tables. They were putting together sandwiches for the luncheon. They were organizing the silverware, preparing the salads and desserts. Some of them wore ugly aprons. <laughs> It was just one person who wore an Iowa State apron, but that's okay. I had to do it, okay. I think there ended up being at least 12 or more of you who were here for several hours to serve, set up, and clean up all to support the Diggins family. I don't know why each one of you showed up on Friday to help. And perhaps some of you came with some assumptions about what your work would look like. Some of you showed up on Friday morning, maybe out of the kindness of your heart. Some of you came because maybe you didn't have any other plans. But for many of you, I imagine you showed up because you too have been served and supported in a time of grief, in a time of pain. I like to imagine that some of those who were here on Friday were here not exactly to return the favor, but to show the hospitality that so many of us have received when a parent or a spouse or a sibling has died. We know what it's like to be offered love and support in a time where we need healing. And so when we've begun our own healing, like Simon's mother-in-law, we then rise up to serve those who have served us, or to serve those in our community who are most in need of being served in that moment. Just as Isaiah puts it, once the Lord has renewed our strength, then it's our turn to rise up and serve again. It's the way that we function and live as a church community, and it's clearly found in the roots of our church, going all the way back to the very beginning of the Christian community found even in Jesus' life and ministry. Like Simon's mother-in-law, who responds to her healing and gratitude found in her service, there are other examples of what I call gentle responses found in this, this four-part text. After the healing of Simon's mother-in-law, then Jesus goes out to continue his healings outside the home and out in the community, out in the wild. We're told he cures many, and the demons, they respond to Jesus by becoming silent, for they know his power and his authority. Night falls, and when morning arrives, Jesus goes out into a deserted place for prayer. This is where I believe we begin to notice the theme or the rhythm of Jesus' ministry. It's healing and prayer. Healing and prayer. His healings, they don't happen without first his, his time spent in solitude, his time spent in prayer with God, because his ministry is a mix between action and contemplation. And I believe it's important that ours, our lives, resemble a similar pattern. However, when the sun rises and the disciples cannot find Jesus, they, what, they panic the text says the disciples hunted for Jesus, and that word just, I don't know, I don't love it, probably because I'm not a parent yet. <laughs> because when I hear that word hunted, I think it's like a parent whose child fears his parents have, have a, a child has feared that his parents left him alone in the store, right, when their parent just turned the corner for a minute. <laughs> the child hunts for the parent. The disciples hunt for Jesus. And I would argue that the disciples here, they're not responding, but they're reacting. They're reacting with fear because they cannot find their teacher. But when they do find him, Jesus doesn't react harshly. He responds.
minds, responds with grace, and he says, let's keep moving forward. We have more work to do. And like Simon's mother-in-law, Jesus illustrates what a gentle response looks like rather than this jarring reaction that later can cause anger or resentment to spread. I think it's true that not all of us may be like Simon's mother-in-law. We might not all be immediately able to rise up and serve. Not all of us have reached a full healing. Not all of us have the ability to serve in ways that we used to, and so we're not exactly sure how to serve in new ways quite yet. But I do think that as we all are in this, this journey, I think forever, of, of searching for our healer, each one of us has the ability to respond to that which happens to us with love in our hearts as opposed to reacting to each situation with with despair or fear. And while we may always have assumptions about what our service is going to look like before we arrive, I think Jesus reminds us in the text today that serving is about meeting the needs of those being served and not about meeting the needs of the one who comes to serve. One of my favorite authors, Jan Richardson, wrote it really well when she wrote, when she offers a blessing for all of those like us who are searching for Christ, our healer. She writes a a short blessing, and it's inspired by our text today from Mark. It begins like this. She says, that each ill be released from you. And each sorrow be shed from you, and each pain be made comfort for you, and each wound be made whole in you, so that joy will arise in you, so that strength will take hold of you, and hope will take wing for you, and all may be well. And I think there's only one thing that I would add and all may be well, so that we too can go out to serve those who are now in need of this blessing too. May it be so. Amen. Amen. This is the time in our service when we lift up the prayers, the joys, and the concerns of those in our community. And you can see the list that we have uh, in your bulletin insert. I believe most of these we've had on our list already, but a couple that I wanted to to um, share with you or just highlight. One is for Darlene, Carol's sister. She did leave the hospital, so we continue to pray for um, her recovery in this time. Our friend Shirley went to the hospital last week, Shirley H., and now she is back over at Grandview after having a minor stroke. So please keep her 
close to your heart in prayer. And our, our friend Mary B., her sister Darlene, is having surgery. It was supposed to be tomorrow, but instead it'll be in a couple weeks. But as she anticipates a, a couple of surgeries coming up, we keep her in our prayers. If you have a, a joy or concern you'd like to share, the microphone will be passed around, and you can just raise your hand, and um, we'd love to, to hear those. Um, I have two concerns. I have my friend Betty, I just found out on, I think it was Thursday, she's dying and it's been a real struggle for me because I'm a chaplain in the American Legion, so she's my best friend and it's been really hard. And my other concern, I don't know if it's a joy or concern or not, but I'm scheduled for surgery at the end of March for my fir first of my knees, so we'll see how that goes too. But a little, I'm a little scared, but I know it needs to be done. Thank you. Um, continued prayers for you and for all who remember Betty and, and for you as you prepare for surgery in March. Thank you so much. Yeah, I have a prayer concern. Well, I have a neighbor, uh, Eileen and her son Ralph, and she just recently had a stroke and uh, not doing very well. She's in Des Moines, so, and also, my brother-in-law, Darren Donnelly, we've been praying for him, and he, excuse me, he's having lots of problems. He's on the kidney transplant plant list, and he's going through all kinds of pain, and we just pray for him. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Prayers for Darren and for Eileen, your neighbor. Thank you. Uh, I'd like prayers for my brother, my younger brother. He always tells me I'm his much younger brother. <laughs> um, my brother Kurt, he is in the hospital. He's been there since Thursday in Des Moines for testing to find out what's going on with him. Thanks, Kathy. Prayers for Kurt. I would just like to lift up this loving congregation. Milt and I are healing, and we wouldn't be nearly as healed without all the cards, lovely cards, and prayers. We love you all. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you. Prayers for my daughter's friend, Holly, who has cancer, and also for my grandson and his wife, Josh and Sarah. Prayers for Josh and Sarah continue. And prayers for Holly. Thank you very much. Thank you. We'd like prayers for our daughter, Glenda, from Arizona, who has pneumonia and been on three different antibiotics and was to schedule to come see us Friday, so we'll see. Thank you, Eileen. Prayers for Glenda. We'd like prayers for our good friend Larry, whose wife passed away very suddenly yesterday. Lifting up Larry. Thank you, Kathy. Being from the Fort Dodge area, I ask for prayers for family and friends of the two young people and mother-in-law who were shot last Sunday and for prayers for their three young daughters under the age of 16 that have been left behind. Thank you, Pam, for those grieving in Fort Dodge. Thank you. I'd like prayers for my sister-in-law, Bev. She's been hospitalized with several health concerns. Prayers for Bev, thank you.
joy for the beautiful weather that we're having in February and the sun shining this morning. Yes, thanks be to God for some sunshine. Spring is on its way. We've got one prayer in the choir. Chimes start our uh, spring season this Wednesday, and so I would just like to lift up a prayer that if you have played in the past, we have a couple people who are going to be gone off and on, so if you would consider subbing, we really could, would be very grateful <laughs> if you could help us out, so please just let me know. Thanks. Thanks, Jolene. Prayers for our chimers are excited to return. Amen? <laughs> Friends, let's lift up all these prayers to God now. Loving Lord, be in our midst with your power and your communion of love. We wait upon you in stillness and patience as you have turned our weaknesses into strengths. In our moments of victory and joy, Lord, you lift us up like the wings of an eagle in flight. You celebrate with us just as you grieve with us. And so in the days of routine and duty, you guide us to accomplish what we need without weariness. And in the hours of pain and fear, in the nights of grief and death, you promise to help us walk with steadied steps so we will not faint. For you are our God, and we are your people. And for this, we give you all the glory and thanks and praise. In Christ's holy name we pray. Amen. Let's take a few moments now to offer a portion of what God has given to us back to him and back to our community.
Lord, your importance in our lives is reflected through our gifts. We return to you through our ministries, a portion of what you have entrusted to us. And so we too invest our time and our talents into your work of healing, teaching, comforting, and guiding. May you bless each of these gifts and multiply them to do the good that needs to be done in this community and our world. Amen. If you would, please stay standing as you're able. Let's sing our closing hymn. This is number 526, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. Let us praise our Lord with verses 1 and 2. As we go our separate ways, wherever your next destination is, may you go with this blessing. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the power of the Holy Spirit bring you the healing you might need in this very season. And may his healing grant you a new energy to serve those in our community in need, so that all may know the good news of our God, who renews our strength who mounts us up on eagle's wings so that we may be able to run and never grow weary, walk and never grow faint. May you go in peace. Amen. Amen.